uh, our goal now is to um, figure out what this space looks like without drawing any pictures, purely algebraically. And once we do that, we'll immediately know how to do it for all, all the higher cases, and, 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 the, and the, especially the case that we uh, cared about, okay? So, <clears throat> so, so let's go back to this formula, y equals c1z1 plus cnzn. And now, now I want to know which, which ZA, ZB is actually a boundary of the geometry, which is an edge. Let me draw one last picture, even though I wasn't, I promised not to draw pictures, but uh, so uh, just, just to show, I mean, what is the difference between like one, two that is an edge and like one, four that is not? The difference is that every point Y on the inside is on the same side of 1, 2. That means that Y, 1, 2 can never go to 0 inside the, uh, inside the polygon. It can only go to 0 when Y goes to 1, 2, which is the boundary. On the other hand, that's not true for Y, 1, 4. I could be in here, I could move there, I could go on this side. And so Y, 1, 4 can change sign on the inside. So the things that are boundaries are some pairs A, B, Z, A, Z, B, such that Y, Z, A, Z, B is always positive. It has a fixed sign, but we can just declare the sign to be positive. Okay? So that is the question. Are there any A and B? Is there any A and Bs such that? Question. Are there A, B such that Y, Z, A, Z, B is positive for all y's, for all y of this form. Okay? So, well, let's, let's compute it. Okay? So let's just compute what is y, z, a, z, b for any old a and b is c1, 1, a, b, plus c2, 2, a, b, plus dot, 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 plus cn, n, a, b, and so you see, this has a chance to be positive, right? Why does it have a chance to be positive? The C's are all positive. And these minors, these determinant, these uh, brackets are also all positive if they're all ordered, right? So it has a chance to be all, all positive. But let's look now, just this is a space of indices. One, two, three. Here's A somewhere. And here is B somewhere. OK? And now let's just look what the individual terms look like. So like what is, so let's say A is less than B, OK? So 1AB, that's ordered, that's positive, very good. 2AB, that's ordered, that's positive. 3AB, that's ordered, that's positive. But if there's any index that's stuck between A and B, then I'm in trouble, right? Because that guy AB will be negative, all right? Therefore, it's not actually guaranteed that all the terms in the sum have the same sign. And if they don't, we're dead, because that has to be true for all values of C, right? So just if one of them is negative, just make all the other Cs uh, very small compared to that one, and, 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 and uh, you, are, you are dead, okay? So, so we learned something very interesting, that the only way this can happen is if there's no space between A and B. And therefore, it works only for things that look like i, i plus 1. Isn't that cool? Okay, so you see how the positivity of the c's and the positivity of the z's tells us the boundaries. The boundaries are y, z, i, z, i plus 1 greater than 0. Okay, so we learned that the boundaries are exactly what we see visually from the picture as 1, 2, 2, 3, and so on. Okay? Now, next, how would you conclude, how would you tell this blind person uh, that you've triangulated this space by summing 1 i i plus 1? Well, the first thing you'd have to do is to tell them, so now I'm just going to look geometrically at the sum over i of 1 i, i plus 1, okay? The first thing you'd have to do is tell them 
uh, is, is, and you can check this very easily, but we won't do it here, that the, these one i, i plus ones for different i don't overlap each other. They don't like pass through each other, okay? That's actually very easy to check. In other words, the way you check it is you say, say y is inside one triangle, can it be inside the other one? Okay? And so for it to be inside one triangle, you have to, well, anyway, you just write it as a positive sum of, of those guys, and then you just write it, translate it to the other one, and you just see that it's impossible. They can't, uh, uh, it, it can't be done. So I'll skip that step, uh, but you can check it algebraically just as easily as you can draw it in the uh, picture. Okay? So, so that already means that you have a collection of objects that are not passing through each other. At most, they share edges in common, but uh, other than that, they're not passing through each other. So then, what do you have to do to check that this actually covers the space? You want to check that it has the correct boundary, right? That the sum of all of them has the correct boundary. Well, so just geometrically now, now this is the space, this is not the, the, the canonical form, this is just the sum of those simplices. Okay, I'm being a little sloppy with the notation, but this is just the geometric thing, right? A sum of these uh, simplices. So let's take the boundary of the sum of these Simplices. Now, I hope you remember from very basic simplexology that the boundary of ABC is, again, it has this anti-symmetric structure, AB minus AC plus BC. It's those intervals, right, which are the, the edges of the triangle. So let's just take this uh, boundary, okay? So this is, the, so this is the, the polygon, let me call it P, to, uh, as opposed to the canonical form. But what is the boundary of P? The boundary of P is the sum over I, and now let's write it out. It's 1I minus 1I plus 1 plus II plus 1. Okay? And as you see, in the sum over I, all of these pieces involving 1 cancel telescopically. Right? And all I'm left with is the sum of II plus 1. Okay? So this is the algebraic way of seeing that this collection of triangles, 1, i, i, plus 1, actually covers the inside of the polygon. Okay, the pieces are non-overlapping and the boundary is correct. Right? Therefore, the canonical, therefore, the, 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 so really, the formula is that the canonical form for the polygon is the sum over i of the canonical form for 1, i, i plus 1. Okay? And that's exactly the formula we've been talking about. Okay, any questions about this? No? So now let's proceed up to the four-dimensional case. Now where we can't visualize it. But now let's, let's go back and let's extend this uh, construction that we just talked about. In general, we're talking about y equals c a z a in any number of dimensions where the c a's are positive. So these are in the positive g one n, and the z's are positive in the sense of the positive Grassmannian z a one through z a uh, whatever i is z b whatever it is is positive. Okay, now, so this is the convex hull of a bunch of points where the points have the property that uh, all these, uh, all these uh, ordered minors are positive. This is actually, as a polytope, as a famous polytope, it's been studied by mathematicians for, I don't know how long, over 50 years, it's called the cyclic polytope. Okay, it has a name, it's been, and from the point of view of the amplitudron, it's also the, uh, it's also the simplest example of the amplitude, again, with k equals 1. We haven't seen any fancy, more fancy Grassmannian stuff yet, and at tree level, we, we won't get to it. Um, uh, but, uh, okay. But let's now see here, let's now see here how we get, <coughs> how we discover the, uh, the, uh, the uh, geometry. So now let's, let's ask the same question again. Our question now 
is what are the boundaries? And now we want to ask, are there four Z's? ZA, ZB, ZC, ZD. Before we had two Z's, now we have two more dimensions, so we have four Z's. Are there A, B, C, D such that this is greater than zero? It's the same, same exercise. This is C1, 1, A, B, C, C, C D, plus dot dot, plus C, N, N, A, B, C, D. This has to be bigger than zero. And let's draw the same picture in index space. So now we have A, B, C, and D. And again, I have one, two, three, et cetera, OK? So now, what does it take? See, we're dead again if there's something between A and B, OK? So there shouldn't be anything between A and B. Good. So let's say they're on top of each other. So this part is i, i plus 1. But you see, now we're not forced to have c right next to that anymore. The reason is that, let's say I have some index here. Okay? Then, in order to put it back in the correct ordering, I have to jump over two guys, i and i plus 1. So that doesn't cost me a sign. Right? So this is OK. So any distance here is OK. But there can't be a separation between C and D now. OK? So I have to have something that looks like i, i plus 1, j, j plus 1. Okay? Those are the boundaries. And you can see that it clearly works. Again, wherever the indices are, I either get these are positive, if it's one of these, it's zero. If it's that one, it's zero. On this side, it's in the wrong ordering, but I jump over two to put it back in the correct ordering. Then I come here, it's zero, zero. On this side, it's the wrong ordering, but I jump over four to bring it back to the correct ordering, and they're all positive. Okay? So that's remarkable. We've learned, just as a consequence of this positivity, that the boundaries have this uh, magic structure, y, i, i plus one, j, j plus one, bigger than zero. Now, if we had longer to rhapsodize about these poles and momentum twister space and so on, or if you're familiar with it, you know this i, i plus one, j, j plus one structure is 100% equivalent to locality for the scattering amplitudes, the fact that they have local poles. And all the ones that don't look like that are spurious poles. Okay, those are the ones that cancel in BCFW. All the physical ones are the ones that look like i, i plus one, j, j plus one. And if you ask you know, those of us thinking about these things you know, five years ago, that's a burning question. It would be, where the hell does this i, i plus one, j, j plus one structure come from? Because purely from the point of view of R invariance or the Grassmannian or any of these things, who cares? You could have anything. There, there's what's so special about these i, i plus one, j, j plus one poles. And the answer is this. Okay, the answer is that there is this defined by itself object. In this case, the k equals 1 amplitohedron, or the cyclic polytope. And just in its definition, with no malice of uh, foresight, no desire to match anything about physics, the boundary structure gives you the key fingerprint of, uh, of locality. Okay? The, the fact that the, the only poles in the answer ultimately, because remember, we're associating the amplitude with the canonical form, and the poles of the canonical form are exactly when that happens. Okay? So somehow the only poles out of nothing, just this positive structure, we discover the only poles are local. Right? But of course, we're getting much more than that. We're going to get the whole answer now. So now let's show why that sum of 1 i plus 1 jj plus 1 triangulates, and it's exactly the same argument. So now it's the same, the polytope again is the sum over 1 i i plus 1 jj plus 1. And it's the same argument, the sum over i plus than j, and the boundary of p is just the sum of 1 i i plus 1 j minus 1 i i plus 1 j plus 1 plus two other terms, and then finally i i plus 1 j j plus 1. Once again, all of these things cancel telescopically in the sum, and I'm left with just the sum over i less than j of i i plus 1 j j plus 1. Okay. 
So that's what this collection of objects was trying to tell us for so many years, okay? Is that they were, they were actually triangulating uh, the cyclic polytope. This k equals one amplitohedron. Okay? So this is the, this is uh, the old-fashioned amplitohedron story, <laughs> all right? It lives in this Y space. The object lives in this auxiliary space. In this case, the, just this P4. It's uh, this larger space is associated with the extra room that we made uh, to bosonize the supersymmetry. And the relationship between the amplitude and the form had a little jig in it, right? So, uh, uh, but, but, but after that, we could just play all the time in this Grassmannian space. And, uh, um, uh, and uh, we have this nice uh, positive, uh, we have this simple polytope. All right, now, in this space, I'll just quickly write down, but we won't do anything with it yet because I want to move on to the third description of the uh, amplitohedron because uh, it's conceptually simpler in some ways. It's a little bit more abstract, but it's conceptually simpler in some ways. Um, uh, and it lives in kinematical space, most importantly. So the uh, generalization, at least for the tree amplitohedron, we won't have any time to talk about loops uh, in this language. We'll talk about it in the other language in a moment. Um, is just that instead of just having one y, we have k y's. This i is going to run from 1 to k plus 4. In fact, mathematically, we can call it k plus m for any old m. Uh, i is going to run from 1, uh, alpha is going to run from 1 to k, so I have k points. And it's going to be invariant under a GLK transformation so that these are going to give me a k plane in k plus m dimensions. So y lives in the, the, the space of k planes in k plus m dimensions. For physics, we want m equals 4, but we can talk about it in general. We have external data, z, which is positive in the sense that all the ordered minors, all the k plus m by k plus m ordered minors are positive. And we take a positive sum of the positive external data. And here is where there's something really novel happens. Uh, these Cs are positive in the sense of being inside the positive Grassmannian now. Now, G plus Ki. Okay. So that's uh, Alex's positive Grassmannian. But once again, as in our previous picture, the, the Zs are fixed. So it's th this is the image of the entire positive Grassmannian under this map. It's a many, many to one map, just like it was for polygons. But as you move around the whole Grassmannian, as you move around the, the whole positive Grassmannian, you paint the inside of some region in GKK plus M, and that region is the tree amplitohedron. Okay? So it's just the generalization of the notion of polytopes, or really specifically cyclic polytopes, into the Grassmannian. So it's a Grassmannian generalization of the notion of polytope. Just as we saw in our previous, but here I'll just be sketchy, just tell you, just make the declarations. Just as we saw in the case of, uh, just as we saw for k equals 1, you have to go down to low dimensional cells of the positive Grassmannian in order to find things that are on 2, right? So just like before, we have to go down to these two dimensional cells that covered, there were triangles inside the polygon. Here, we have to go down to k times m. 4K, for the physics case, 4K dimensional cells. And the 4K dimensional cells are some triangle in this space. It's just that now these things are all curvy. Okay, the, all the, the equations are non, are the, this is not, uh, um, uh, these positivity conditions are non, not nonlinear. But the picture is that each cell in the positive Grassmannian, so I have a cell in the positive Grassmannian of dimension M times K, so given any cell gamma m times k, or 4k for the physics case, that lives in g plus kn, each one of these is mapped to some kind of curvy region inside g, k, k plus m, which is where y lives. 
Okay? And so if you have a collection of cells like this, the collection of cells can kind of tile some space, which itself has a God-given description to begin with, which is just the image of this map, of the whole map. Okay, so I have the image of the whole map, which is some curvy region that lives in GKK plus M, and again, I can triangulate it by breaking up into pieces. And each piece is coming from some cell of the positive Grassmannian of the appropriate dimensionality. And as you learned in the previous lectures, hopefully in the week, all the BCFW terms, all this stuff are associated with cells of the Grassmannian. But now, again, there's the answer to the question why you're taking those guys and putting them together, okay? Those are the ones that tile and cover the amplitohedron. And there are many ways, other ways of getting the canonical form. You don't have to do it that way. So it's not tied to this recursive picture in any fundamental way, okay? So there's just some object, uh, which is just a generalization of polygons into, uh, polygons and polytopes into Grassmannians. And, uh, and the canonical form associated with those uh, objects, the canonical form of the Y space, uh, calculates the tree scattering amplitudes, okay? So, um, so that's all I'll say about the old-fashioned way of thinking about the uh, uh, amplitude. Perfectly correct. Um, but now I want to spend the last uh, 15 minutes uh, telling you about the new way of thinking about the amplitude. So this, and so to do this, we'll go back once again to we'll go back once again to the formula for the R invariant, and we'll interpret it a third way. Okay. So I'm doing it in this, uh, going back and forth between the form, just to make things a little bit less abstract, and so you see what things are uh, uh, good for in the, in the simplest possible setting. Okay, so, um, <coughs> now let's, let's do the following exercise, right? We had this form on the Grassmannian. Let's go back to the Grassmannian representation for, uh, the R invariant. Right? And we, we keep saying that delta function is doing nothing, it's just localizing C, it's all some glorified Jacobian, right? There's no integral to do, I'm just localizing and so on. In other words, the business part of this delta function is just the constraint that C1, Z1, plus C2, Z2, right, plus C5, Z5 equals zero. Right, that's what the delta function is uh, imposing, right? And what's the point? The point is that if you give me, if you give me, now these are four dimensional, this i runs from one to four, these are ordinary momentum twister variables, okay? Point is, if you just give me those five momentum twisted variables, these are four equations, if I gauge fix C5 to one or something, right? These are four equations for the four unknown C1 through C4. So you give me the Zs, that gives me the Cs, right? Okay? So there's a natural question that we could ask then, given that Given that uh, given that simple fact, we can ask the question. Instead of doing this, I mean, there's a natural question. This form is defined on the Grassmannian on the C space to begin with, right? It's naturally defined there to, uh, to a begin with. So what would happen if we just evaluated the form, dc1 over c1 up to dc4 over c4, forget everything else, just take that form on the Grassmannian, what does it look like in z space on the support of this uh, equation? I forget which one is the call, if this is a push forward or a pull back, it's one of the two of them. Um, I forget which one is which, okay? But, uh, so, but what it, what it means concretely is that you just shove, you solve for C as a function of Z, and you shove those C's into the formula for the form, right? 
So, so let's do that and see and see what what you get. Okay. <coughs> now, in fact, uh, before doing that too explicitly, um, let's actually see what happens. I mean, I can just write this. You know, this is C A Z A I equals zero. And so, if I take the D of this, the D C A Z A I has to has to give me a concomitant uh, shift in dz, right? So dca zai plus ca dz ai has got to equal zero. Is that clear? Right? Therefore, therefore, What I want for the uh, uh, what I want for what I want for the form um, uh, how do I want to do this? Um, Actually, let me do it a little more. Let me do it. Uh, um, <laughs> I don't want to do it in this abstract way first. Um, let me let me do something else. Let me, let me do something else. Um, uh, um, leave this aside for a moment. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm just looking at the time. I don't want to. Uh, so um, let's let's go back to this formula that we wrote for the uh, canonical form in terms of y. Okay, so. Uh, just, just, just for the uh, just for the R invariant. So, w so we we wrote a formula that looked like um, uh, we wrote it as y d four y blah blah one two three four five to the fourth <coughs> over one two three four blah five one two three. This is also as was true for simplices in general. We could write this as d log of y one two. 3, 4, sorry, d log 2, 3, 4, 5 over y, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 d logs, right? The d log y, 5, 1, 2, 3 over y, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? Yes? Oh, there's y's. Thank you. I keep forgetting the y's for reasons that will become obvious in a moment <laughs> why I keep forgetting the y's. Okay? Okay. So, and just to emphasize, these d's are hitting the y. Okay? All right. But now, look at the argument of all these things. What are the arguments here? Right? The arguments there, because they involve y, these are exactly the, those momentum twister four brackets. Right? Because remember, if I, uh, this is exactly what I would get if I projected all the data through y down to a four-dimensional problem, right? All of these brackets are exactly the ratio of the momentum twister. You, you know, the, the z's have this extra component, but when I put the y in front, it's getting rid of the extra component. All of these brackets are actually brackets involving the, uh, the four-dimensional momentum twister data, okay? Of course, the, officially, these d's are hitting the y, okay? But let's just play for a moment, and then we'll. Uh, that formula sure makes it tempting to look at the following thing instead. So let's just look at d log. Let's write exactly the same thing down, but just get rid of the y's. Okay, I'm going to write down d log two, three, four, five 
over 1, 2, 3, 4. D log the last one. 5, 1, 2, 3 over 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? Now there's no y anymore. So if this form is to be anything, I have to let the d's hit the z's. Right? No, we're just playing. We're just playing. You can't sue me. Uh, and anyway, it's, it's kind of an interesting, it's a natural question, right? We write things as d logs of things that only depend on the four-dimensional data after you project through y. So why not just wonder what happens if I take that form and act on it with the z's. Now, this is something you can, uh, I can't do for you in five minutes, but let me tell you the answer. The answer is 1, 2, 3, 4, dz5 plus cyclic to the fourth over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3. And I put an exclamation mark there. Because what does that look like? That looks like the R invariant again, but where you've replaced the Grassmann variables by the differentials. Okay, that's pretty amazing. That uh, um, that this is is the super amplitude. There's no game. Do this. Take phi. Integrate zeta. Extra components. Nothing. The R invariant is a differential form on momentum twister space. OK? Now, what I was the, the when yeah. writing square here, I should explain that this is, uh, shouldn't be understood uh, literally. Because square of one form is always zero. No, but yes, I, I really mean I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm writing four of these guys and I'm epsiloning them all together. Okay, so whenever I have to the fourth, I'm epsiloning them all together, and um, and so so, but but precisely because there's many components, it makes sense to talk about dz to the fourth. Okay, so what this means is that to go from the form to the super amplitude is nothing. You just take the dz and you replace them by eta's and you're done. Okay. So that I think that's uh, the most interesting zeroth order thing here, is that. Uh, the scattering amplitudes now, there are invariants and all their generalizations are literally differential forms on momentum twister space. Okay? No super stuff, no auxiliary spaces, no Grassmannians, literally differential forms on momentum twister space. Okay? Now, the, the, the argument I was telling you a second ago, um, which I stopped in the middle of doing, uh, actually tells you why this always works. <laughs> okay, and this is not, it's not an accident. This is like a third interpretation of the delta 4 slash 4 formula. <laughs> okay, but even much more natural than the second one. This is literally what you get if you take the Grassmannian form, written any way you like, you take the Grassmannian form on a 4K dimensional cell, and you push forward or pull back, whichever one the heck it is, on the C dot Z equals 0 surface. Okay? And if you do that, the form on the Grassmannian turns into that form. If you add them all up, you get some differential form on momentum twister space. And now, once again, you can forget about where it came from and ask, what's the God-given purpose in life of this differential form in momentum twister space? Okay? And how is it associated with the geometry? Now, where is the positive geometry now? Where is it living? Now, just, we're not looking for fun, we're still looking for canonical forms for uh, forms somehow, but it's already different, right? Beforehand, the canonical forms were always top forms, and they're living in the big ambient space. Now the momentum twister space is much higher dimensional, it's 4n dimensional, and we're looking for lower dimensional forms, 4 times k dimensional forms, um, that are somehow fixed by some condition in this uh, 4 times n dimensional space, okay? So, um, Okay, so uh, I have five minutes left, and so that's just uh, motivation that we should be looking for something in uh, directly in uh, momentum twister space, and uh, it's motivation for 
another way of trying to think about what the amplitahedron is. Okay? Um, uh, after all, you know, what we'd, what we'd really like, even on completely practical grounds, what we'd really like is an answer to this question. Let's go back to the polygon, as I said. If someone hands you a point y in, someone hands you a point y, you want to check is it in the polygon or not. How would you check, right? You don't want to see whether you can write it as y equals c dot z. You want to, the way to check is to check that y i i plus 1 is positive for all i, right? So that's the way of cutting out this polygon by specifying what the boundaries are, okay? So, um, so you might like some description of the amplitahedron in the same way. Okay, can you cut out the amplitahedron in a simple way with a bunch of inequalities like that? The same way we can cut out polytopes. And uh, when it is a polytope, of course you can, but for higher k in general, you can't. Okay? And uh, I can't in three minutes explain why that is, but, uh, well, maybe I can give you a, 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 a tiny uh, flavor, because probably something very, very important that you've seen in, uh, I'm sure, in some combination of Alex and Jake's talks is this formula for 2 by 2 minors of G24. Okay, so that's again the Schouten identity. Okay, so this, this is the, uh, so when we say that all the minors of the positive Grassmannian are positive, and we say all the minors are positive, that's great. If we, um, uh, we can, for example, say that 1, 2, 2, 3, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, there it's uh, 3, 4. Thank you. 1, 2, 2, 3, uh, uh, 3, 4, and 1, 4 are all positive. And then I just have to say 1, 3 is positive, and 2, 4 is automatically positive, uh, for example, because of this uh, formula. And a very important thing about the positive Rasmanian is that the first boundaries, the co-dimension 1 boundaries, just correspond to setting 1, 2 to 0, or 2, 3, 3, 4, or 1, 4. So despite the fact that you said all the minors were positive, you can't actually, in the first boundary set, for example, 1, 3 to 0. Because if you set 1, 3 to 0, something else has to be set to 0 before that. Okay? Alright, so that's great. So the only co-dimension 1 boundaries are 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, and 1, 4 positive. But if you just say those are positive, that doesn't cut out the positive Grassmannian. Okay? And you see why. If you just say those are positive, that's compatible with 1, 3, and 2, 4 either both being positive or both being negative. Okay? So this is a kind of a funny space. If you just look at the space where all the uh, co-dimension 1 minors are uh, positive, it doesn't cut out the, uh, the positive Grassmannian alone. In fact, there are two regions that are glued on a co-dimension 2 <laughs> boundary. Okay? And there's one good part and there's one bad part. And the bad part, um, uh, so the only way to cut out the whole thing, naively, is just to say that all the minors are uh, positive. Okay? Um, so that, that was the uh, challenge, um, but the, uh, the strategy, or the, or the insight, is that in order to ask the question, in order to answer the question, in order to answer the question, is Y in the amplitahedron or not, what you should do is think about what the configuration of vectors looks like. You have a bunch of Zs that are positive, you have a Y, in order to see whether y is in the amplitude or not, what you want to do is look at what the configuration looks like after you project through y. Okay, so you project through y to go from 4 plus k dimensional data down to exactly the 4 dimensional momentum twister data. Okay? And um, if we talk about these things in the... Uh, uh, okay, so, so, so the claim is that there is something special about what the, what the four-dimensional momentum twister data looks like after you project through y that encodes that y was in the amplitahedron. Okay. Um, now, in fact, if you take the definition of the amplitahedron, you can begin by going all the way down to m equals 1. So this was the tree amplitahedron. Again, we have y alpha is c alpha a z a i. And uh, alpha runs from 1 to k and i runs from 1 to m plus k. Okay? So m equals 1 is a particularly simple case. 
Because after you project through y, what do you end up with? You just end up with numbers, not even vectors. You just have uh, one-dimensional vectors, okay? And here is the interesting claim, is that when are these one-dimensional vectors in the amplitahedron? When is y is in the amplitahedron if and only if the one-dimensional vectors that you end up with have the following property. So here you pop down, this is little z1. This is what I get after projecting through y. So it's just numbers on a line. Little z2, little z3, z4, z5, and so on. Okay. The claim is that you're in the amplitahedron, y is in the amplitahedron, if and only if z1, 2, 3, 4, 5, if I just take this path, then it hops over the origin precisely k times. Okay. So it's fully determined by giving uh, a pattern for the number of times you jump over the origin. Let's talk about the case k equals zero. Okay, the case k equals zero, you don't jump over the origin at all. All the z's are positive. Okay, but in general, uh, uh, being in the being in the amplitude for general k means that in this picture you jump over the origin precisely k times. In other words, this is completely equivalent to saying that you're in the amplitude in the m equals one amplitude if and only if this sequence of numbers y1, y2, up to yn, say so put the y back because that's what I get after I, uh, that's, uh, these numbers are exactly, uh, that's what it means to project through, uh, to project through y. So if and only if this sequence of numbers has exactly k sign flips. Okay, so the fundamental definition is, is uh, about counting sine flip patterns. Okay, so this is something that we sometimes call the, uh, the amplitahedron's binary code. Okay, so you, can, uh, you, you project and then you have to have uh, precisely k sine flips. Now, what if you're in the m equals 2 amplitahedron? Okay, well, there's a there's a very natural thing that, that, that you can do. So you have, you're, in, you're in m equals 2. Now the vectors have, the z's have two more components. If you project through y, you come down to a two-dimensional picture, not a one-dimensional picture. Okay, but the idea is that you just come hell or high water, you try to get down to one dimension any way you can. Right? So what we're going to do is take that two-dimensional configuration, and we're going to further project in the direction of any one of the z's that we like. Any one of them that, 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 that we like. So I could do, for example, z1. If I project through z1 as well, now I'm back down to one dimension. And the claim is that I have to be in the m equals 1 amplitahedron for the guys that are left. Okay? So if I project through 1, I project it through y and 1. This sequence, y12, y13, y14, should have k sine flips. But there's nothing special about 1, so I should be able to do this starting from anywhere, right? So, uh, so it must also be true that I have to demand y23, y24, blah, 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 blah. All these things have k sine flips. So that's the fundamental rule. You just project in any way you can down to m equals 1, and you have to end up in the m equals 1 amplitude. Now, it turns out that it's a, a derivative fact from this, so that's the fundamental rule, but there is a faster summary of this rule, which you can derive from this, which is the following. That you're in the m equals 2 tree amplitahedron, again, if and only if, all these y, i, i plus 1s are positive, Okay, so that's what we saw. Remember, the polygon is actually the case m equals 2, k equals 1. I should have commented on that before, but there were three-dimensional vectors. So k was 1, uh, so that, that corresponded to m equals 2, k equals 1. So this is the obvious boundaries. So that has to be true, and then only one of these sequences is, is enough. y12, y13, 
up to Y1n has k sine flips. What about n equals 4? So this is the, now the complete definition of the, uh, of the tree level amplitohedron. Okay? Now these boundaries, yi plus 1, jj plus 1 has to be bigger than 0. And this sequence, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 5, you just choose three of them to begin with, 1, 2, 3, 6, and so on, has k sine flips. Now here I'm still using the language, here I'm still using the language of having y. But you see, all I'm doing through the y is projecting through it. So I could perfectly equivalently say that there is a subset of the configuration of momentum twisters. And in that subset that has the property, now just get rid of the y. That subset of momentum twister space that has the property that all the i plus 1, jj plus 1s are positive. And that these sequences, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 5, up to 1, 2, 3, n, have exactly k sine flips. Okay? That's a subregion of momentum twister space. That's part of the avatar of the amplitohedron, now purely in kinematical space. Okay? That's an interesting subregion of the uh, of momentum twister Grassmannian. By the way, if you do this for k equals 0, what do you get? If you do it for k equals 0, we say, that let's say we have all the i plus 1, jj plus 1s are positive, and all of these minors are positive. So the k equals 0 case here should just give me the positive Grassmannian for g4n, because there's no y at all. So all I'm left with is the z's that are 4 by n dimensional, right? And they're just positive. So, well, this is just another description of the positive Grassmannian now. This is an example of, of a phenomenon that you. Uh, uh, that you probably heard about from, again, Alex or, or Jake or both, that you don't have to say all the minors are positive. It suffices to say that only a subset of the minors are positive, and that can force all the rest of them to be positive. And this is actually such a set. Okay? In fact, it isn't one of the classic clusters. Um, it's a funny combination of different uh, clusters. But still, it's true. It suffices. So these minors being positive suffices to guarantee that all the minors are uh, positive. So already for the positive Grassmannian, this is a slightly different characterization of the space than one of the classic ones. But it extends beyond the positive Grassmannian. Okay, so now in flat out momentum twister space, there are different regions uh, which are characterized by this sine flip pattern. And the sine flip pattern can also be said uh, more globally, instead of projecting down to one dimension, you can also state it as a kind of global fact about the whole configuration of uh, vectors, which is a statement about a uh, generalized notion of winding number. <laughs> okay? So when you go to m equals 2, these are just two-dimensional vectors, and they really have to have a particular winding number, <laughs> okay? classic winding number. In higher dimensions, it's a higher dimensional notion of winding number, and that's a more global way of talking about it. So you give me a configuration of four-dimensional momentum twister z's, if they have the right winding number, uh, they can, you can imagine having gotten them uh, by projecting through uh, some y in the uh, amplitohedron. Okay? But now, now the amplitude is a form living in momentum twister space that's now tied to this geometry. <laughs> in, uh, in the same way canonical forms were tied to the amplitohedron. Okay? Um, let me just uh, finish, I, I, uh, let me just finish by telling you the extension uh, for all loop order. So let me just summarize, at least for the physics amplitohedron here, for m equals 4. So to all loop order, um, we have that uh, we have y, i, i plus 1, j, j plus 1s are positive. We also have these lines in momentum twister space. Uh, so, sorry, so let me say it all in, in momentum twister language. Okay? So I just have some z, i, z, a, sorry. These are momentum twisters. This i runs from 1 to 4. And I have these lines, a, b, i, j, which are these lines uh, in momentum twister space. Um, and at, at L loop order, well, I have L of them. So this goes from 1 through L for L loops. OK, and, and so here are the rules. We have to have that uh, Zi 
zi plus 1, zj, zj plus 1. Again, there's a more primitive set of rules just involving sign flips. And this i plus 1, jj plus 1 business comes out of it. Okay, just like I told you before. But let me summarize uh, the, uh, just so you see what the succinct definition is. So the, these physical poles are positive. The poles involving each one of the loops and z i, z i plus 1, bad notation, gamma, z i, z i plus 1 are positive. So th that's the obvious thing. That's the physical poles being a positive. And this sequence, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 1, 2, 3, n, has k sine flips. Oh, sorry. One more positivity is that the loops are mutually positive. So a, b, gamma, a, b, gamma prime is greater than 0. So those are the obvious positivity constraints. And then it's just that the sequence 1, 2, 3, 4 up to 1, 2, 3, n has k sine flips. And 1, 2, and a, b, 1, 2, a, b, 1, 3, to a, b, 1, n has k plus 2 sine flips for every loop independently. That's it. Okay. So in the space of n vectors in momentum twister space and L lines, and the, and the loop momenta are represented by L lines, there is that subspace. Okay. And the claim is that the n equals 4 integrand to all loop order is, in an appropriate sense, a canonical form for that space. Okay. So now the, these geometric structures are living directly in kinematic space, right? not in auxiliary spaces, directly in uh, kinematic space. Um, the thing which I didn't have time to explain is uh, precisely how I get, how I associate a form with these regions. And just in 30 seconds before we go to dinner, let me just give a cartoon for how it's done. Because what's funny is that I have a space, even let me just say I'm sticking at tree level. My kinematical space, my kinematical space is just a space of momentum twisters. And so this is a, you know, four by n dimensional space. Okay, so here I have my big kinematical z, z space. It's four times n dimensional. But I'm looking for a form that's four times k dimensional. So it's not a top form. So in what sense are we, uh, what sense do we have a canonical form? And the answer is the following. There's this region that we just talked about. This region, which is defined by these sine flip patterns, and I hope you see, these are what we would naively have thought from the co-dimension one boundaries. I told you they weren't enough. And these extra topological conditions, winding conditions, are what complements that to, uh, to uh, complete it. What I find more interesting is that these actually are a slave to these. So I didn't write them down. Uh, but uh, the more fundamental thing is just these, and then these even follow from them, okay? But anyway, there is some region in the momentum twister space, you can call it the, this sort of positive region or the generalized positive region P, and it's top dimensional. So in order to connect finally to the old amplitohedron and the literal picture of a canonical form, we also have to find a subspace. So in this, four times n dimensional momentum twister space, there's a natural family of subspaces whose dimensionality is four times k. And uh, just to give you an idea of how we define this subspace, you just start with any particular point, z star, in momentum twister space. And you look at all the z's that you, you can get. You, you look at all the z's that you can get, z a i, that start from that z star a i, and they just go in some linear direction away from that of the form y alpha um, uh, y alpha i and some some numbers here uh, delta uh, a alpha okay so in other words what I'm doing is taking a point 
and I'm doing a translate, I start from some z star and I'm translating in the direction of a fixed k plane in, uh, in n, n dimensions. Okay, so this is just an affine subspace in the, uh, in the momentum twister space, but you see what defines that affine subspace, the data that defines it, is exactly the data that we associated with the old story of the apotahedron. To define one of these subspaces, to define one of these subspaces, the y's are the things that are moving around, so what defines them is giving this z star and this delta. Okay, but I can group those z stars and deltas together for each a, okay, there are four of these and there are k of these. And that's exactly what I, we were calling the like big Z A data before that was four plus k dimensional. Okay? So the old external data of the amplitahedron is, you see, we don't have external data anymore in, this, in the conventional sense in this picture. We just have a differential form on, on momentum twister space. I'm not fixing any specific values for the external data. But, I do need to find this family of this, I, I need to find a subspace, or more precisely, a family of these uh, uh, subspaces, but if I fix z star and delta, that's one sub subspace. That subspace is associated with exactly the same uh, data that we talked about for the amplitahedron before. And now the claim is that this 4K dimensional subspace intersects this big positive region in a shape, and the shape is a positive geometry, and that's literally the old amplitahedron. So this is, see this is now four times k dimensional. How do I move around in that space? I move around in that space by moving around with these y's, and those y's are precisely, have the same dimensionality as the uh, old amplitahedron. Or let me say it another way, all the z's that you get on this plane can be interpreted in the following way. Start with this data in four plus k dimensions, and project through k planes in every possible way. Take every possible k-plane in k plus four dimensions and project this data through that. If you do that, you will move everywhere along this four times k-dimensional plane, okay? Only some part of this plane is in the amplitahedron, okay? And that's the part where this thing intersects the uh, positive region. And therefore, what fixes this form, what fixes this four times k-dimensional form is that when you pull it back, to the subspace, it's the canonical form for the amplitahedron that lives there. Okay, so that's the final story. As I said, it's somewhat more abstract than any of the two previous stories, but now it has the great advantage that it lives directly in the space where the amplitudes live. Okay, and so we can now ask questions directly in momentum twister space, um, uh, whose answer, there's no massaging, the differential form is directly the super amplitude, Okay, and the positive geometry lives directly in the asymptotic space at infinity, right? Where it's supposed to live, coming back to the, uh, to the first motivational part um, of, the, uh, of the first lecture. So I think I will stop here, and um, if, uh, uh, if people are interested either during or after dinner, uh, I can complete the last exercise that I was going to do for you, which is to show you how we can quickly, from the sign flip picture, derive the one loop amplitude, okay? So just by staring at the sign flips, um, uh, we can very quickly get the triangulation of that formula for MHV one loop. So you can see concretely and practically how this way of calculating things works. Okay? All right, thanks. <laughs>